Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Oh Yum with Anna Olson. <clears throat> That's me. If you're new to the channel, I'm so glad you could join me. And if you've been watching for oh, some time now, welcome back. I'm thrilled. It's been a while since I've been able to do a live stream. I've been in, involved in a few projects uh, and I'll mention one of them later on. But I've been coming and going a fair bit and finally I have a day where I can think about the months coming ahead and I do love the autumn baking season. Now I know if you're in the southern hemisphere, you're entering spring in your summer season, um, but for us here in Canada, I'm excited about fall flavors, fall spices, even if actually here in southern Ontario, it is a rather warm day. Of course, I have to do my shout outs to everyone. Kathy, hello, Raf, uh, Bonnie, who else have we got? Hermione, thank you. I think, you, I, as I've said before, you've watched every single live stream live. And Jade, I think, is joining me for the first time. So hello, Jade. Um, for those of you who may be new to watching my live streams or haven't caught too many because we do post them on the channel within moments of us wrapping up here, I just walk through a few recipes, start to finish, no super duper editing to compress a wedding cake into six minutes. We're doing things real time here. And what I like to do is share my tips behind that specific recipe. So today's is an especially fitting one, I think. I am making pumpkin scones with uh, lots of autumn spices and I'm also making an apple pie preserve that pairs wonderfully with the scones or makes use of apples in season and then you've got something to enjoy all winter long and could even make a great gift for the holidays. We're not talking about the holidays yet. The reason I think making scones today is fitting is uh, we lost Queen Elizabeth yesterday and whether you're British or not or supported her or not, she is a high, an icon of our modern history and so I think making a scone feels absolutely appropriate. Now this is not a classic English scone. This is a pumpkin scone which means it's got a softer consistency than a regular scone. Please note that I'm going to keep an eye on the thread. Before I get cooking I'm just going to take a quick look at everybody's uh, comments. Well lots of hellos out there even from, I see Southeast Asia, hello to Singapore. Uh, we've got lots of greetings there. Oh, and we've got someone whose sister uh, went to culinary school and Michael, who is operating the cameras, uh, taught her um, and has been watching for a long time. Hello to Malaysia, lots of hellos to everyone. Let me jump into the recipe. Now, of course, you can see the full recipe printed out below for both the scones and the apple pie preserves. So you can always come back and revisit the recipe. Um, starting with the scones, I have preheated my oven to 400 Fahrenheit, so that's 200 Celsius, and I've already measured my flour into my bowl. So this recipe you make by hand. It comes together quickly so you can crave making pumpkin scones and be eating them within a decent amount of time. Now I don't add granulated sugar to my flour mixture because I'm using maple syrup to sweeten the scones and I'll add that with my liquids. But I will add my full tablespoon of baking powder and I've got my assortment of spices here plus a little bit of salt. I've got cinnamon, ginger, allspice and clove. And so of course, if you have a pumpkin pie spice blend you like to use, you can pull all of these spices out and just add two teaspoons of that to your mixture. So this all goes in at once. And when I'm making scones, I don't worry about sifting the ingredients because we are working the ingredients together so much so that sifting, it just, it, it just adds an extra step to the process. Now I'll add, ask Michael if he wouldn't mind grabbing my ice cold butter from the fridge. So scones are one of those preparations where you want to work with cold butter. 
typically the temperature of your butter is the indicates the temperature of your ingredients um, throughout the recipe. So like a cake, you start with room temperature butter and then all your other ingredients should be room temperature. But scones benefit from cold butter to help make them nice and flaky. Even a softer style scone like these pumpkin ones. So what I'll do is take my 175 grams of butter and using a box grater, grate that into the flour just like it was cheddar cheese. You want to work quickly. If you have really warm hands, you might want to use a little paper towel to hold the butter so it doesn't get too slippery or melt on you. And it's amazing how that, oh sorry, I made a mistake. My error, the recipe below is correct. It's half a cup of butter, 115 grams, not three quarters of a cup. I'm thinking about my pumpkin puree measurement. That's what I'm doing. Get all the butter from the inside. I see some stuck to my box grater. Get that back in. And now I'm going to use a pastry blender to start working in the dough, but then I will actually switch to my hands. So the butter gets worked into the flour just by sort of twisting your pastry blender. You really could even do this with a whisk if you wanted to or two butter knives. But what you're trying to do is break down the cold butter into smaller pieces, but keep it cold at the same time. And those little pockets of butter, when they melt, when they hit the heat of the oven, just let off a little bit of steam that pushes up the flour around it and that's what makes the flaky scone. Okay, I see we've got a good volume level. Thank you everyone for helping us out. We just want to make sure we're good. Um, and yes, you are right. Bee Leering, maple and pumpkin is pretty yummy. It's a nice combination. Um, and hello to Andrea from Hungary. I'm just taking a peek while I'm cutting in my dough for the comments here. Ah, Ahmad is asking a good question. In hot climates, do your ingredients have to be cold? Um, when it comes to things like pie pastry and scones, yes. And if you're fighting a hot, humid day uh, or a climate, then put those ingredients in the freezer. So when they come out of the freezer, they'll adapt quickly to the temperature change and it buys you a little extra time. Now, this is my little trick when I'm making scones, or as you say in the UK, scones. I like to rub the butter between my palms and then those tiny little pieces of butter flatten out a little bit. So it's almost that same principle of laminating dough when you make puff pastry or croissant dough that you're just creating sheets of the butter and that will help build in that flakiness. And hello to California, South Africa, Spain, and uh, someone's asking about current trips. Well, speaking of Spain, Michael and I are heading off in a couple of weeks to host a culinary tour. We'll be in Madrid and Seville. Um, very, very excited. Love the, the cuisine of Spain. So um, hopefully I'll come back and be able to talk about it and share a few recipes with you. All right, so now my butter is worked in and it's time to add the liquids. So I do have, this is, this is the correct measurement, three quarters of a cup, 175 ml of pure pumpkin puree. So if you are in the grocery store and buying tinned pumpkin, you wanna make sure you're not buying pumpkin pie filling. That has added sugar and spices. Pure pumpkin puree is just that. Uh, when the season comes about, our pumpkins aren't quite ready yet, our fresh pumpkins, it won't be long. Uh, but they, what you have to do is buy the pie pumpkins, which are smaller and they're darker in color. Those are the ones for roasting and turning into your own pumpkin puree. And what you do is cut it in half, scoop out the seeds, put it face down on a baking tray, pierce the outer skin with a fork, and you bake it in a 350, 175 oven for about half an hour until it's soft. Once it cools, you can just peel off the skin, puree it, and then freeze it to use later on. So it is easy to make. But those bigger pumpkins that you use for jack-o'-lanterns, they're too pulpy, stringy, and watery for baking. 
That said, different countries have so many different varieties of pumpkins. So the squash type, you could even use a butternut squash in this recipe. You could use sweet potato in this recipe, but you want that dense um, style of puree. Ube. Oh, ube, good suggestion, Michael. Ube would work very well. If anyone's watching from the Philippines, I love the ube. And then you would end up with a brilliantly purple um, scone. It would be fantastic. Add a little ube extract because it adds a, more, a little more purple color. Now, the sweetness, I promised. Some pure maple syrup, which, yes, I know we are lucky here in Canada that we have access to it. This is actually um, our friends who live locally who actually make their own maple syrup. It's not that common. Not everybody is able to make maple syrup. Um, and it's, is it 20 liters, Michael, that cooks down to make one liter or 40? 40 to 40 liters of sap get cooked down to make one liter, liter of maple syrup. So even here in Canada, though it's plentiful, it is a luxury ingredient as it is around the world. As a substitution, you could use a maple flavored syrup. You could use honey, but what I would ask you to do is reduce that amount of honey to half and replace that with uh, the, that half of liquid. So this is half a cup of maple syrup. Use a quarter cup of honey and a quarter cup of milk to replace the volume of the maple syrup, only because honey is thicker and it has a more concentrated sweetness. So you have options. I hope that's answering some questions for you. Oh, we have, oh, Ira likes the idea of the ube. We've got some Canadians watching. Uh, oh, Hermani, I saw your question pop up earlier about making scones with frozen blueberries and it becomes kind of a, a bit of a mess and your scones can come out a bit gray um, as the frozen blueberries melt. And so what I like to do is I, if I use frozen blueberries, I, use, I don't thaw them first. I use them right from the freezer and I give them a good toss in uh, flour and then kind of shake out the excess flour and then quickly, I don't add the blueberries when I add my liquids to the bowl as I'm flattening out my scones, I kind of sprinkle them in and fold the dough over so the blueberries barely come in contact with the dough and that does help. Um, if you find they're still too soft after you bake them, Hermione, I would increase the flour by a little bit in the scone dough just to balance out the moisture that cooks out of the frozen berries. So I hope that gives you enough information to go on. So I've whisked an egg my maple syrup and my pumpkin puree. Together, this goes into the bowl all at once. And now I'm going to stir this just until the dough starts to come together. So I still want to see some flour in the bowl before I turn it out onto my work surface. And while I'm stirring, I'll take a peek. Uh, Raja, you're asking, when can I share the recipe? You'll find it right below the screen. If you see the show more button, if you click on that, you'll see the full recipe expands and is open to view. Um, oh, hello from Nigeria. Thank you for joining us. Oh, this is a good question, Ira. The difference between scones and biscuits, or scones and biscuits. Biscuits quite often, well, it's, it's a matter of geography. You think of biscuits as being American, quite often Southern American, and they can be very fluffy in style, quite often with buttermilk at their base. And it's less about the flaky, buttery delicacy. It's more about the fluffiness and the volume and the lightness. So you crack into one, it's beautifully light. It's good for swishing around a plate with juices or slathering with butter. I mean, well, so is a scone too, but the consistency is a bit different. Where a typical English style scone is a little more dense and even actually a little more dense than this dough. My hands are going to get sticky, so I just wanna warn you, I will have to step away once I get this dough shaped to wash my hands for a second. I do have a little extra flour in case I need it, and I'm using my dough cutter but you could just use your spatula. And I'm finishing bringing the flour into the pumpkin by sort of flattening the dough and folding it. 
and rotating it just to make sure it doesn't stick. Hello from Mexico, Edmonton, Alberta, Veracruz, Malaysia. Um, Nancy's asking, did I recently take a boat or ship excursion? I haven't. I do have, I am hosting a French river cruise, but that's September 2023, so a year from now. Um, I think there's still space available. If you go to my Instagram feed, you'll see uh, the post. It was a couple months ago, um, but the link is still active if you'd like to check it out. Um, oh, and there's a link on my profile page on social media. Okay, I've got my dough just about combined and you can see the little butter bits are visible. That's absolutely fine and acceptable. You don't have to, this is not a cake dough, so you don't have to fully bring the butter. You're not creaming the butter into the dough. It can have a presence in there and that same tip applies to pie pastry. Now I'm going to, I've divided the dough in half. And I'm just going to cut the scones into wedges. If you wanted to do a cookie cutter, you could, but because this is a softer dough, you will find that it kind of relaxes as it bakes. And so a wedge is an easy way to get the shape you want. So I'd say that's about two, two and a half centimeters high. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle. Um, Oh, hello from the UK and Indonesia. Thank you for joining me. Guadalajara, amazing. Um, and Catherine's asking, is there a country I have not been to that I would love to travel to? Oh, yes, so many. Um, and so many places I want to go back to. I would love to visit India. I would love to visit South Africa, Australia, Japan. Um, there are lots of countries in South America I have yet to visit. I'd love to go to Peru, to Colombia. Um, visit countries in South America and I'd love to explore the cuisines of Mexico too. Um, and I, I hear such great things about the food in Mexico City and Oaxaca. Um, just feel like I have to go. So each disc I am cutting into each disc, dish, each disc I'm cutting into six little scones and they look kind of unassuming right now but you'll be surprised how much they grow in the oven. So give them a fair bit of space. It really, you can't put more than the 12 on the baking tray. And I'll bring the tray over so you can see. Here we go, now I have a little space. Let me make a little more here. go and line these up with lots of room. Now I'd like to top these scones with a maple glaze um, just to finish them off and they are not overly sweet on their own so the glaze just adds a nice little bit of sweetness. If you wanted to skip the, the glaze altogether just whisk uh, an egg or even just an egg white um, or you could even take milk and brush the tops of the scones and that will add a little bit of shine, promote some even browning, so then they're ready to go on their own. These only take about 12 to 15 minutes. My first batch, I have already baked one so they could cool, so I could glaze them for you. Um, that took 14 minutes in my oven, so it really depends on your oven. And convection or not, with this recipe, it doesn't matter. A, a scone does well in a convection oven because it really coaxes it to rise up nicely. Um, in which case you set your oven to 375 as opposed to 400 to compensate for the fan. And somehow mine ended up a little lower, so we're going to fix that. And I'll set my timer for 12. That way I know I can take a peek. And while these scones bake, and I'll be able to show them to you in just 12 to 14 minutes, we can take a little time and make the apple pie preserves. And so at the same time as I'm going to share this fun recipe with you, I'll give you sort of the, the basics on safe preserving and canning because if you are buying local fruits and vegetables in season this time of year to put them up for winter, you need to know some basics in terms of doing it safely. 
I'm going to step away for just one second so I can wash my hands. I'll be right back. You want to sing a song, Michael? <laughs> You're going to hear the water because, of course, my microphone is right by the sink. <laughs> a lovely interlude here. There we go. Not too sticky. There's some, some things you just, a damp tea towel is not going to clean up. All right, let's talk about apple pie preserves. Um, we're doing, oh, and I'm taking a pause to look at everybody's questions. We've got a lot of people joining us. This is wonderful. And we have 265 likes so far. You know I like to put the dare out there. Let's bring it up to 350 at least. We can do that. By the time I finish the apple pie preserves, I am quite certain. Um, oh, this is so great with, um, I'm just catching the questions come in. Oh, here's a good question from Ahmad. To give a savory scone some structure, can you knead the dough? Be cautious about kneading the dough too much, Ahmad, because then a scone turns more into a bread. And this is not a yeast-based recipe. It's baking powder that makes it lift. And if you overwork the dough, it may end up just toughening it. You do have the addition of the butter, which will help, um, but it is better to work in a little extra fat. Um, that's typically what you do when you're making, say, a cheese scone, that the addition of the grated cheese adds a little extra fat that keeps it tender, but it gives it body and holds it together. So I hope that helps. A little extra butter or um, Parmesan cheese is also a great addition. And Amy, you're asking a great question. Can these be frozen? Yes, they can. From the point where I cut them into the wedges, you can pop them on a tray, throw them in the freezer. That way they'll freeze individually. Then you can just pack them in a container and pull them out when you want them. I do recommend baking them thawed as opposed to directly from the freezer because of their moisture. But if you pull them from the freezer and put them on a baking tray, let them sit on the counter. Basically, by the time you preheat your oven, those scones will be thawed out and ready for the oven. So just thaw them until, they don't have to be room temperature, but until they are soft and then you're ready to go. And they'll keep in the freezer. My general rule for optimal freezing time is three months, but I know a lot of us keep things in the freezer for a lot longer. Don't, don't keep them for longer than a year um, because they'll just pick up free, freeze ta uh, freezer taste after that. But optimal is uh, three months ahead. So great to have on hand when the weather starts cooling down and you're just ready for that break and a cup of tea, but you want something freshly baked. Um, okay, let's get to the apple pie preserves. So I have already started the process because when it comes to preserving, you want, you don't have to do huge batches. We are not of our great grandparents preser uh, generation where we had to preserve in order to survive the winter. Um, we are so lucky we're able to buy fruits and vegetables year round. And, but the act, just like baking, we don't, none of us have to bake, but we love baking and preserving is the same thing. It's a gratifying activity. It's relaxing. It's rhythmic. It follows a pattern and a step. And at the end of it, you have something that you can proudly share with family and friends. It makes great gifts. And then you do have something that was created at peak season that come winter or off season, when you open it up, it is just a, just a beautiful taste of that time of year. And so these apple pie preserves, instead of my making a blueberry jam or a blackberry jam or a peach, I wanted to do something a little different. And these preserves, um, taste exactly like apple pie in a jar. So you can use it as a dessert, you can put it on a cheese platter, and they pair wonderfully with these scones. Um, I'm gonna, I'll bring the, cam the pot over. So just as a note, the recipe that you see below is double this amount. Because I had to do so many stages of the recipe for you, I wanted to split it so that I didn't have apple pie preserves everywhere. <laughs> so this is six apples, which I have peeled, cored, and diced up. And I tossed them with the lemon juice and just started them simmering. You bring them up to a simmer. And this is a key step. So in terms of weight, for the full recipe below for 12 apples, you're looking at about 1.5 kilos after you have peeled and cored them 
Um, when you're, if you're buying the apples to make this recipe, then it's about buy about two kilos, and once you peel it and core it, you'll have enough for the recipe. And you don't have to measure them that precisely. Um, and I'm, I'm basing this on a medium-sized apple. So first, let's talk about what apple varieties suit uh, an apple pie preserve. Because I want my apples to hold their shape. I want them to have a nice tartness. So my rule is, for apple pie preserves, use the kind of apples I would use in an apple pie. Um, Granny Smith is a variety that I think is pretty much available around the world. And everybody knows it. And even if you can't Granny, use, get Granny Smith, use that as your benchmark when you're picking your local apple variety because every country has different types of apple. Here in Canada, um, apple pie apples include Granny Smith, they include Honey Crisp is a personal favorite, Crispin that are sometimes called Mutsu, kind of have a body and a structure so they don't turn all watery and mushy, Spies, Spart Spartans, even uh, Cortlands work well. You're eating apples, like Golden and Red Delicious, like Macintosh, are too sweet and they're too mealy um, for cooking into an apple pie preserve. You'll have applesauce uh, before you end up with anything else. So this is why I've opted for Granny Smith just here. And so it took about just 10 minutes for these apples to come up to a simmer with the lemon juice. And the reason I don't add my sugar right away is because if you add your sugar immediately to your fruit, and this goes for any fruit jam, it cooks into the fruit and actually almost candies a little bit, and you can end up with a jam that's tough. The fruit is actually tough within the juices. And so it's a good idea to soften the fruit first before you add your sugar. Um, and, oh, Amy's asking, are apple pie preserves the same as applesauce? No, because we're going to keep this diced texture, so it's got a nice chunky to us. To, chunky texture to it. So I'm going to put this back on the heat now that it is has softened and I have my added ingredients. So how would you like me to hold them so everyone uh, over the uh, over the pot? Okay so the first thing I'm going to add, now remember this is a half recipe I'm adding um, 200 grams or one cup of sugar so the recipe below says double because it's double the amount of fruit. So really, not a lot of sugar um, as preserve, a preserve goes because we don't have to add pectin to this recipe to set it. So you don't need that high amount of sugar. Um, I've got, before I added my lemon juice to the pot, I zested my lemon. So that goes in. And you'll see the recipe calls for sliced ginger, which you can add just coins of sliced ginger if you want. You just have to remember to pull them out afterwards. I got ahead of myself and grated my ginger. And then those apple pie spices of cinnamon, a little bit of allspice, and I happen to have a whole nutmeg. But I, that combination of apple and nutmeg together with that hint of allspice, to me, are the perfect spices to add for an apple pie combination. And now what you do is you bring this up to a simmer, just over medium heat. You don't want to scorch the preserves on the bottom. And you let that cook for about 20 minutes to let the flavors meld. And you'll see when the apples turn a translucent color. They're no longer um, as brightly white as when they were fresh. Then you know your apple pie preserves are cooked. Now normally when you're making a jam, you would consider adding pectin, which is a starch that's naturally found in apple cores, apple skins, uh, strawberry seeds, blueberries. Quite often the, the pectin we buy is apple based. And what that does is it reacts with the sugar and acidity that you put in your ingredients. And then that starch thickens and creates a gel um, that sets your jams. But this is a preserve, it's not a jam, so it doesn't have to have that set. And the apples themselves let off natural pectin, and so it thickens all by itself. But it doesn't get a hard set, and it isn't tough at all. Um, so what you can use that 20 minutes to do is get yourself organized and ready for your preserving. So what you want to do is have your jars on hand. You can use different sizes. You want to make sure they've been properly washed 
and I already have my pot of water that is at a low simmer now. I will increase it once I remove my jars. And what you want to do is drop in your jars into your water to sanitize them and get them really hot because you're going to add hot, your hot apple pie preserves to your hot jars, put the lid on, and you want to create that seal from the heat inside the jar. Then you boil them for just 10 minutes. It doesn't take too long. And then you cool them. And as the preserves cool, that creates the vacuum that seals them in, and then they are shelf stable. If you don't want to go through the whole jarring, canning process, you can just cook your apple pie preserves for 20 minutes, let them cool down, put them in a jar, and keep them in the fridge, and they will keep for weeks in the fridge. Not months, not years, but they will keep for weeks, but you have to keep them refrigerated. The other key note is, when you're making these preserves, if you want to make them and go through the canning procedure, you cannot reduce the sugar, as tempting as it might be, because that sugar acts as a preservative that keeps the apple pie preserves just that, preserved. Um, if you do want to re reduce the sugar or use a sugar substitute, then you go to the refrigerator version. You can also freeze them if you wish, but don't put them in a glass jar, use a freezer, freezer safe container. So, I'm, oh, perfect timing. I was just gonna check on the scones before I get into the whole canning process. Um, so let's take a peek here. Oh, they're coming along, but I'm going to give them another two minutes. So as you can see, we've got the flakiness building in. Look at that beautiful lift. But they're just a light brown on the top, so I wanna give them another minute or two in the oven. Oh, they smell pretty. <laughs> they smell really good. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the weather is outside, this smells great. Okay, another two minutes. Well, that gives me time to organize my space here. Have a couple of clean tea towels handy. I'm using regular rubber coated tongs to get the jars, the empty jars out of the water. And then there are a few tools you will find are handy to have if you're doing some canning. Always keep a clean, damp paper towel on hand. I've got my jar lifters, which are, these are for extracting the jars out of the boiling water and to drop them in. These are also handy. If you make creme brulee, they're the easiest way to pull your creme brulee or your sticky toffee puddings or whatever you make from a water bath out onto your cooling rack. A good clean ladle. And this funnel is designed for preserving because it's got the wide opening so you won't get spills. It makes filling your jars a whole lot easier. How's everyone doing? Uh, Ahmad, you're asking green apple works too? Yes, Granny Smiths are a green apple. Just so long as you're not using a yellow delicious. Um, oh, and Mia's asking, do I like to pre-cook my apples before an apple pie? It really depends on the apples. Um, I have done it when apples are at their freshest, they actually let off a lot more juice than an apple that sat in storage for a while. So I don't cook all of my apples when I make an apple pie, I cook half of them down. That way I still get the freshness from fresh apples, but I do cook down half so that way I concentrate the flavor, um, the pie won't be as watery after it's baked, and um, oh! It was one of my dishes that slipped. I don't know what that was. <laughs> I'm awake though. Um, uh, to finish my thought there, um, and then you'll find too, you won't have the collapsing of the, um, the pie crust when, if you par cook your apples because it will already be partially reduced. Okay, here we go. These come out. That was crazy noisy. <laughs> Yes, these browned after two minutes, just browned a little bit more. And I can feel their light when I pick them up. Yeah, I have, I have tough hands, I can pick up hot things. And I'm just gonna set these over here to cool. Grab a cooling rack. And let's get back to these apple pie preserves. So what I'm going to do is swap out on the burners so I can heat this up safely, is show you the apple pie preserves after 
they've cooked for about 20 minutes. So you want to make sure before you're preserving them that you see bubbles rising from the surface, that it's at a full simmer. So that's what I'm doing right now. Do you want me to bring the preserves over just so we can take a close look? Okay. But you can see now that there is a bit of juice around the apples and it's thickened up nicely, but the apples still hold their shape. And they will go more translucent as they sit in the jar because you're heat processing them. So as these heat up, I'll get my jars ready. And you don't have to work with any particular speed. Once you draw the jars out of the water, they are sanitized. You've got a few minutes to get yourselves organized. It's not like it has to go in the jar right away. I've got a cutting board with a tea towel. I like to work with tea towels when I'm jamming because these things don't slip. I know it's a clean tea towel and it just keeps my work area tidy and, and safe because the jars won't be slipping around. I'm going to increase the temperature on my pot of water because you do want it at a full rolling boil when you're heat processing jars. And you can use an assortment of sizes, shapes, what have you. So there are my jars, drop a funnel. And additionally, I have two-step lids. So you've got your lid that goes directly on top of the jar itself with the rubber seal at the bottom. Then you've got the ring that goes on top and secures it in place. Both have been washed. You don't have to heat process your rings at all. They never come in contact with the food. I have a little cold water on my lids now, but you need to now soften that rubber seal a little bit. So what I'm going to do is take some of my boiling water from the pot. You don't want to put boiling water directly on the seals because that'll actually soften them too much that when you put them on the pot, it could actually push the rubber on the outside and you don't get a perfect seal. But now I'm warming them up a little bit and my preserves are bubbling away. If you can hear that, I can turn off my oven now. And I'll get the rings out of the way. I've got my preserves here. And now we start filling. So as I mentioned, you can do this and just pack it in a container and keep it in the fridge. But it is handy to learn how to do this safely and where you have to follow the rules um, quite firmly in terms of doing this safely. So when you're filling a jar with anything, it could be pickles, a jam, or preserve, you want to make sure it's filled almost right to the top, a quarter inch from the top. Because if it's underfilled and then you make sure you can't see any air bubbles around the sides of your jar, you can give it a little tap just like you do your cake batter before you put it in the oven. And this ensures you're going to get a good seal. This is all it takes. I didn't know how many jars to have ready. I think I'm only going to use a couple here. But I have my second batch on the go. So I'm making sure that's filled right to the top. And I might as well do these small ones. The yes, the headspace is essential. So you can't fill right to the top of the jar or there's no air for a vacuum to be created to seal the jar. And if you leave too much of a gap, the pressure is too low and you won't get that proper seal. So that's why that headspace, that gap at the top is such a specific measurement. And this one I overfilled because this is only a 125 mil jar. Take a little bit out. But isn't it nice to know, in a short amount of time, you can make a small batch of preserves. It doesn't have to be a whole day project. Like I said, you're not making this to survive the winter. Um, 
And I'm going to put just my remainder back in my other pot. If you have any left or a half jar of jam, that's the one, that's the one you get to sample first. So you just put that jar in the fridge. There we go. And now what you want to do is even though you had the funnel, you want to make sure the rim of your jar is clean. So with a clean, damp paper towel, you give it a little wipe. I can re-sterilize those later. And now you always want to use new lids when you're preserving like this. You can reuse the jars. You can even reuse the rings. But these can only be used once because of that rubber seal. There we go. And then when you're putting on the ring to secure the lid, the term used is finger tight. So you don't, you don't need to press too firmly, but just until you start feeling resistance. All right. Oh, here's a great question. Kat is asking, can you use cornstarch instead of pectin? And honestly, the answer is no, because cornstarch um, becomes cloudy once it's chilled and it starts breaking down in the presence of acidity where pectin needs acidity to activate. So cornstarch, you'll find if you make your preserves thickened with cornstarch, say you're making a blueberry pie filling, you'll find that you get a little separation in the jar and you're gonna start seeing weeping or liquid around this sort of jelly in the center of the jar. And it will go cloudy once it's chilled, so not as appealing. Um, you'll see a lot of commercial preserves may use different gums or other setting agents that are plant-based. Um, but really the simplest is the natural apple pectin. Okay, oh, Linda makes apple butter. Um, which I, when I make apple butter, I do it in a crock pot and it takes overnight and the house smells so good when I make apple butter. Uh, can I preserve apple butter the same way? Yes, you can. Um, because you have cooked down your apple butter. So in a nutshell, for anyone who's new to apple butter, it's like taking apples and then cooking it down to applesauce and then cooking down that applesauce to a fraction of its size to concentrate the flavor, it concentrates the sugar, it concentrates the acidity, and that makes it shelf stable. So yes, you can go through this process to preserve your apple butter. Um, if you ever have questions, use a reliable, trustworthy website to verify your recipes and proportions, because as I said, you cannot reduce the sugar, the acidity, or if you're making pickles, the vinegar or the salt, and guarantee you're going to have a shelf stable jam. You have to follow those formulas, the, the proportion of acidity, salt, or sugar, which is what preserves our foods when we do it this way. I'm gonna move these back over to the stove, drop them into my pot for 10 minutes, and I'll make sure I hit a full rolling boil before I set the timer. And you want to make sure your jars are fully covered with water. The lids should not be exposed. And now I'll turn that up. Once I see a full rolling boil, I'll set the timer for 10 minutes. If you are preserving at a higher altitude, which means you have a lower air pressure, um, there are guides you can find because you actually need to increase the cook time on your boiling because of the lower pressure. Water boils at a lower temperature, at higher altitude. Um, when I learned how to bake professionally, I went to school and our cooking school was in the Rocky Mountains and we learned to cook and bake at 8,000 feet above sea level. So I got a really good crash course in high altitude baking. Some of my instructors also got a crash course in it too. Uh, Deborah's asking, what do you use apple butter for? Well, it's got a delicious concentrated flavor and it's got a, a rich dark brown color and you use it like jam, um, but because you don't have to add sugar, because it's so reduced and concentrated, um, yeah, you use it in baking anywhere you would use a jam or a filling, spread it on your fresh scones, on a maple pumpkin scone. So now that I have my batch of scones already cooling, this one I didn't realize would probably be, have been cooled by now, um, let's make the simple maple glaze to go on top. So I've already measured my icing sugar into my bowl, and I'm going to add to that a couple of tablespoons of water. 
couple tablespoons of maple syrup. And I'm just gonna use a fork for this. Now this glaze, this recipe for a glaze makes a thinner style glaze, one that is brushed over the scone to completely cover it and add a nice even layer of sweetness. If you want more of a thicker glaze that you drizzle on top, you simply add more icing sugar. And to give it a really nice consistency, I add a little bit of melted butter. It just thickens it up and it sets on top of the scone nicely. Now, if you're new to making scones or scones, um, oh my, we have cracked 350. We're well over 400 likes now. Thank you, everyone. Um, if you're new to making scones, they are best enjoyed the day they're baked. So that's why I'm so glad, Amy, you asked about the freezing tip. So it's best to freeze them unbaked and then bake them fresh because that is how they're best enjoyed. Though you could bake them and freeze them, but don't glaze them if you're popping them in the freezer. Great question, Finn, with lots of numbers. Uh, what is the difference between a preserve and a jam? A preserve is a more general term. Um, so in the case of this apple pie preserve, it, it has the sugar and the acidity to be preserved. It could be any fruit in any texture, any sweet style, uh, where a jam is whole fruit mashed with sugar and then set with either its own natural pectin or with added pectin. So it has more of a set to it. Um, and jellies are strained. So you mash the fruit and you let it slowly drip and separate so it's clear and then again set with the sugar and the pectin. Um, oh, I love getting these questions. And please, um, I love, oh, great question. These questions coming in. I haven't had, had a peek in a while. Nancy is asking, could you use these apples and puff pastry for a turnover kind of thing? Yes, please. They would be fantastic. It, it essentially, when you have them made, you've got apple pie filling ready to go. So you could have pre-baked tar shells and fill them. You, you could make turnovers with them, little danishes, filled brioche. Cheese plate. Cheese plate would be delicious, or char charcuterie. Serve, serve with a roast. Yes, serve it instead of applesauce with a roast. Um, you could make this recipe with pear instead of apples if you wanted to, but you have to increase the lemon juice. Uh, apples have a, a, at least double the lemon juice in the recipe. Pears are sweeter and lower in acidity. Um, you could add cranberries to it. You could add raisins to it. You know, like apple pie, however you like it. It's fantastic. So here's my simple glaze, and I'm just going to brush it to really cover the scone. And it sets on after not a whole lot of time. I love what we can accomplish together in under an hour. I mean, it takes a little organizing, and I still will have to do the dishes afterwards, of course. But. I'll do the dishes. Oh, you're very sweet. In case you didn't hear, Michael's offered to do the dishes. It's on the record. Um, Susie is asking, what is cake and pastry flour? Is it cake flour or pastry flour? Um, Depending on what country you live in, it may be labeled differently. And in the commercial baking business, there are fine differences between cake flour and pastry flour. But generally for the home baker, cake and pastry flour is made from a softer wheat, meaning it's got a lower protein content and it is also milled uh, more finely than all-purpose flour. So it is designed to be made, be used for delicate cakes and pastries because it'll ensure they're not tough. Um, if you were to try and make bread using cake and pastry flour, you would find it would be dense and heavy because there's no strength and the yeast, the air yeast produces would just burst right through. Uh, contrast that with double zero flour, which is um, a finely milled flour, Italian style of flour, but it has a high protein content. So that's why it's used in pasta and pizza doughs, because it's got the protein to hold together, yet it's milled more finely so that it has that delicacy and you get that good stretch, the chew, when you make a really good pizza crust. So it is not cake and pastry flour, even though it's milled finer. Um, 
Oh, Nancy's offering to help you do the dishes, Michael. <laughs> um, oh, Catherine's asking a good question, wondering what happens to all these baking versions of things, because clearly 24 scones and two people in our house is, that's a, a lot of scones per person. Well, Bonnie, I know you're watching, she'll be getting a few scones in just a few minutes. So I do pack them up and give them to family and friends. And it's true, when I have a larger production with a larger crew, everybody gets a box of goodies and gets to take it at home. And when I'm really in a large scale production where I'm doing episodes of things back to back, um, I've been lucky in the past to have a good relationship with our local food bank and shelter. And because they know I can declare all of the ingredients, they will sometimes even take some of my offerings. So, but that's only when I'm doing lots and lots and it would be fair to bring a larger quantity. So yeah, nothing gets wasted. Um, but of course, now that I've made these preserves, I have, I'll put a label on it. So you do want to label it, put the date on it. It doesn't have to be the month and day, but the year that you made it. And if you have any specific notes, you can always put the ingredients on. So if you're gifting it, people will know what's inside uh, of it. Put your name on it, of course. Own it, because aren't you lucky you just uh, made something that is, is so worth sharing. I think I pulled out this platter because I wanted to plate. I'm happy to, oh, here we have a question. Does Star, Starbucks have these scones? You didn't hear it from me, but yes. Was that an inspiration for me to work on this recipe a little bit? Maybe. Um, so it is that style, if you'd like. Oh, I'm gonna stack these up. So these will be completely set in half an hour or so. They won't take long to set, but even though they're still a little sticky, I'm gonna stack them up. How inviting is that? And I'm going to pull a couple of my jars of the preserves. I can always pop them back in. And I do want to set that timer. For 10 minutes. Just to show you what the preserves look like. So they don't change their appearance. But you'll find after cooking, they will, after a day, they will set up a fair bit. I'm going to take some of my preserves from my other pot just so I can assemble a scone while I finish answering some last remaining questions. So there we go, some apple pie preserves and scones. What a lovely way to spend an hour making these delicious treats. Okay, uh, and here, here are some great questions. Hello from Singapore, hello. Um, yeah, Bonnie's excited about getting her preserves. Here's a question. How do you store bottled preserves? So if you're buying jams and jellies from a store, they probably have a high ratio of sugar um, to keep them very, very shelf stable. Unopened, they can live in a cool, dark place for a long, long time, um, one to two years even. Once you open it, even though they will, with that amount of sugar, keep okay on the counter for a little while, the minute you start dipping a spoon in, if there's any cross-contamination, you can develop mold or bacteria. So it is best to keep them in the fridge once they've been opened. Um, oh, Amy's asking for more pumpkin spice recipes. I can certainly oblige with that. Um, if you're trying to look up recipes, I have so many recipes on this channel. Uh, go into the channel search and just plug in the word pumpkin. I think you'll see I do have my pumpkin spice cake cookies with a delicious frosting on top. They are great this time of year. I do have a couple of recipes for pumpkin pie that appear, one with a whole wheat pastry crust. Um, so yeah, keep an eye on the channel here. And that brings me to a point. Part of why you haven't seen my live streams as regularly as previous is that I have been working on a fun new project called Food Travel Diaries. And this will be launching. This is a new series that will launch right here on this channel starting October 7th with a new episode every Friday. 
I will join you for a live stream at the premiere and then there will be the premiere function so I can live chat with you while the episode airs for the very first time. Yep, my oven's on. Um, and I hope you'll join me. This was an exciting project where um, we have traveled to a few destinations and we're actually heading to another one next week. Explore the food, explore the cuisine, share the experience with you through some of the video footage that will, will be included in the video. But we always end up, I know you love seeing me make recipes, so I create recipes. I don't try and replicate them, but I create my own recipes inspired by those travels. And I hope you will join me because I have got some fun, fun recipes in store. Hints, a baklava inspired recipe and dessert pasta. So keep yourselves tuned at the channel. That's just two. We've got seven episodes. Seven? Seven <laughs> episodes airing starting October 7th. So I will hope you'll join me. There will be that live stream. I'll have a live stream towards the end of October and we are already planning our holiday live stream. So you know I'm going to bring some baking throughout this cold weather season to you. Um, thank you for all of your kind notes and support. Um, it's great hearing from you and I'm just the, your co comments are so supportive. You're the best. Oh my gosh, baking people are just absolutely fantastic. So now let's split into a scone. Are you gonna zoom in, Michael? I can't zoom, but I'm on. Okay, and that's why you go through that process of flattening the dough out and layering it so you kind of you get that built-in flakiness and it splits even evenly i'll just break off a piece we've got a little apple pie preserve of course if you're a purist you're going to put a little bit of butter on there at the same time there's no such thing as too much butter we all share that in common i really appreciate your support today i thank you for joining me oh look at that we've taken it to exactly an hour how perfectly timed have a fabulous weekend everyone and remember this video will be posted right here on oh yum shortly afterwards so you can go back and watch and i really hope you'll give these recipes a try i know you can do it both the scones and the apple pie preserves cheers mm. the spices Mia was watching from Redondo Beach, California. Cool. Nice group.